Rotator cuff injuries are common and can range in severity. On uh, this week's Health Talk, we'll talk about causes, symptoms, and when you need to call an orthopedic surgeon. So stay tuned. We're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. And I'm Dr. Vicki Smetak. Today we are going to talk about rotator cuff injuries with Dr. Paul Protomastro, orthopedic surgeon with Coastal Orthopedics. Paul, welcome the to our show. Hello, Paul. Paul you're, I know you're a shoulder Always expert. A and I should say that Paul did the rotator cuff repair on my son many years ago, and he's doing well. So thank you again for that. That's good. Good news. But, you know, I, I think a lot of people, everybody's heard of the rotator cuff. And I suspect very few people know what we're talking about. So we're tell us what it is. So what is it and how does it get damaged? Well, um, most people come to me saying, I have a problem with my rotary cup. <laughs> um, and so in lay terms, uh, that's what people think of it. The rotator cuff is like the cuff of a, your sleeve, is a envelope of muscles and tendons that surround the shoulder joint. So the shoulder is a ball and socket joint surrounded by muscles and tendons. Uh, we have a good image yeah, let's for bring up the images. anatomy to give so us a, a visual on that. So we're going to teach go. people anatomy. Uh, so the yeah. humerus bone is, it has a large ball on the top of it, that's your arm bone, and it meets your shoulder blade or scapula. So this ball and socket joint is wrapped in muscles and tendons. And then the ball and socket functions under a bony roof or ceiling made by your collarbone and your shoulder blade. In this image, you can see the little blue sac called the bursa sac between the ball and socket and the bony roof. Most of the action in rotator cuff pathology occurs when this ball starts to rub up against the bone above and the bursa sac can no longer protect the tendon. Mm. And so I didn't realize, so the bursa then becomes, as you said, uh, degenerative or damaged, and so the bone is then rubbing directly on the tendons that surround the shoulder head. Well, the most common shoulder pain that we see is a thing called bursitis. So this bursa sac is designed to protect the tendon. So that's again the blue structure. The blue sac. And there. just for the people at home, this is as if somebody is standing and looking towards us. Right. That's the right arm. Of the right shoulder. And that's the right shoulder. That's muscle. The red is muscle. The white is, I guess, tendon and bone. Yep. And the yellow is, uh, is also tendon. Yellow is bone. The yellow is the bone. The yellow is bone. Mm -hmm. Okay, we let's have, have another, the next slide. There we go. Yeah, now this is sort of a cross-sectional picture of the shoulder. Right, so the, the, commonly when, the, when you raise your arm up, the humerus bone starts to rub or engage upon the shoulder blade bone above, pinching that rotator cuff tendon in between. Mm. So uh, as we age or as we do uh, overuse the joint, the tendon can start to fray and can start to actually tear away. So when the rotator cuff tendon tears, it's usually the tendon that is the one that raises our arm away from our side, and people start to develop pain and inability to do overhead work. Mm -hmm. So Paul, that area between the two arrows, yes. it says area of impingement. That's actually the, what you're talking about, where the bursa is. Right, that, that white structure between the two bony structures is the rotator cuff tendon. So it lives in that narrow space, and it has to glide back and forth under that bony ceiling. And that tendon, as we age, the blood supply of it deteriorates, the, the tendon tissue quality deteriorates, and that combined with the repetitive overload can lead to fraying. The analogy I make for patients is the rotator cuff is simply a rope that raises your arm. And that rope, if it rubs on a hard rock right. long enough and the rope starts to mm -hmm. deteriorate, it'll start to tear. So our next picture. So this is a depiction of the green sac is that bursa sac that's designed to protect it. The yellow bone above, called the acromion, bangs into the rotator cuff tendon below, and that's a depiction of the tendon starts to tear and fray. Mm. So this problem is so common that uh, it actually affects 40% of 60-year-olds in the United States, and it goes all the way up to about 60% of 70-year-olds. So the most, the most common cause of rotator cuff disease is degenerative. Mm -hmm. um, however, we do see it in overuse for scenarios from tennis. Do you have very another common. picture, Paul, or is this? Oh, we'll go to it in a second. Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead. So, you know, the most common um, complaint that for people with rotator cuff pathology is pain at night and difficulty doing overhead activities or moving your shoulders into extremes of position. Mm -hmm. um, the treatment of this disorder 
uh, is varied. So we always want to start with conservative treatment. Uh, and then we want to, surgical treatment is our last resort. There's a couple truisms or realities that we have to face. And that is, once the rotator cuff tendon tears, it's not going to heal itself. It has a very That's a really important point because I think almost anything we think in our body will heal, but because of the poor vascular supply. Yes, there's poor blood supply to the tendon. And think about it, the tendon is always under tension. The muscle is pulling the tendon away from the bone, and if the tendon is mm -hmm. no longer attached to the bone, the, the tendon will just keep pulling away and pulling away. What are we looking at here now, Paul? So this is, these are actually images from arthroscopy. Mm -hmm. So arthros inside the arthroscopy joint. is the science and a treatment of shoulder disease with a little telescope through small incisions, minimally invasive surgery. So we're looking through the deltoid muscle into the shoulder joint. The image on the left, the humerus bone is the floor, or the, uh, the bottom there, and that crescent-shaped or moon-shaped defect is actually the rotator cuff tendon pulled away from the so bone. So you shouldn't see a hole mm -hmm. there at all? No, there should not be a hole. So the you should see should... what you see in the next. Right. The slide on the right, right is the tendon reattached or repaired back down to the bone with the use of screws and stitches. So mm -hmm. we put screws into the bone to anchor the stitches. Then we pass the stitches through the tendon to tie the tendon back to the bone. Now. The, that's a technical exercise which is common and safe and very effective. The success rate of rotator cuff repair surgery is 90% plus. Um, the surgery itself is not going to last you your lifetime. What has to happen is the tendon must heal to the bone. So the tendon has to grow back to the bone. That's where rotator cuff repair surgery becomes such a prolonged recovery. So what does that mean for the patient then? Because I would imagine, right, you wouldn't want to put tension on it because you're waiting, you want those sutures to heal, you want everything to go the right way. Does that mean no use for a period of time? Does that mean modified use? What, what, what is the recovery? You're absolutely like? right. You can't, no matter how strongly we repair these tendons, the, the technology is so good, the screws don't pull out, the, the stitches don't break, the knots won't untie, mm -hmm. the tendon tissue itself will rip or shred away if you use it too much. So for six weeks following a rotator cuff repair, you can't use the shoulder. You have to rest the shoulder. Complete rest. It's talking. complete rest, but we start therapy at two weeks to do what's called passive motion. The therapists will try to reestablish shoulder motion, prevent scar tissue and adhesion. Because you, the other side of that, I guess, yeah. is if you immobilize the joint for too long, it gets too you stiff. Actually, you, get, you actually get stiffness. Anybody's had a cast on yeah. knows what you happens to a normal joint. Right. right. When it's so bacon. we can't strengthen a rotator cuff repair for three months. So I tell everybody, if you have a rotator cuff tear and you're a healthy, active person, it's typically going to be a surgical problem. We will try some cortisone injections. We'll try activity modifications. There are medications for pain. Physical therapy can be very helpful. The majority of patients can live with a small rotator cuff tear. But if conservative measures fail and you have persistent pain or, or you can't return to the lifestyle you're looking for, you need to have rotator cuff well, repair surgery. physical therapy work? It, it, it seems almost counterintuitive. Counter you get a tear in this, this right. uh, tendon that serves several muscles. And well, what does physical therapy do? You have do? to remember that rotator cuff tears are a spectrum of disease. Some tears are a half a centimeter. Some tears are five centimeters. So. Physical therapy strengthens the muscles and tendons that are intact. I see. Okay, so th there is some compensation that people can get by with a small rotator cuff tear. So going back to the statistics, 40% of 60-year-olds have a rotator cuff tear. How many of them know it? Probably less than half. Mm -hmm. How many of them are disabled by it and can't live with it despite conservative management, probably 25%. So it's very few that uh, out of the spectrum that end up needing surgery then it sounds like, or, or, or a smaller mi minority of It depends upon the symptoms. Mm -hmm. if, if you're weak, if you're painful, and the simple things don't work, and we know you have a full thickness tear, and you've tried physical therapy. So the recommendations from the Shoulder and Elbow Society and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, six months of conservative management. If you're still symptomatic after six months, surgery is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So how long does it take a patient to recover? It's, I tell everyone it's six months to get back to an active, healthy lifestyle. And this is a, the third largest joint in your body. It's right. gonna take you a year to 18 months to forget about the problem and you won't know which shoulder what it was. Also, yeah. I, I don't think viewers probably 
understand just how complex the, sol the shoulder is, the movements, it how really many dif directions it moves and how it rotates. Uh, that it, it's such a flexible joint. Well, uh, it, and, and that, it does have tremendous mobility, and that's another thing you talk about. What does therapy do for you? Many people will get stiff. The shoulder joint will lose motion from something we call frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. The joint capsule gets tight. Anytime we injure our shoulder or do surgery, which is an injury, mm -hmm. that scarring stiffness process can occur. So our goals with treating shoulder problems are get the tendons to heal, restore shoulder motion, get the strength back, and then finally the function hopefully will follow. Now, uh, we're running out of time, but you've talked a lot about degenerative changes, degenerative changes of the uh, rotator cuff, but we also hear about young athletes injuring their rotator cuff. Uh, it's a little bit of a different process, isn't it? It is. Um, in, in people over the age, I'd say 45 or 50, it's primarily a, a deterioration of the blood flow and the tendon's actually starting to wear and tear because of aging, okay? I know that sounds like a young age, but it really isn't. In the younger age groups, the, the rotator cuff tendon can be damaged by tension. Remember, it's a rope, and you can over-pull the tendon, and the, and the fibers within the tendon start to tear, or partially tear. So pitchers rarely tear their entire tendon off. They'll get a partial tear or a stretched out tendon. It'll hurt so much, and it'll become so weak you can't throw. Mm -hmm. um, and we see a lot of problems with tennis players. That's an overhead sport. Volleyball players have a lot of rotator cuff pathology. The youngest rotator cuff repair I've done is 17 years old. And, and, and anybody into the age of 30, it's gonna take a violent injury. Snowmobile, motorcycle, wrestling injury, hockey, you know, checked into the boards, these types of things. That you're not gonna see a degenerative, you know, just happen to be rotator cuff tear, typically under the age of 45. Return to that level of physical activity after a rotator cuff repair in a young athlete, what, what's, what's that like? Um, is the, throw, the throwing athlete is the most challenging. So Chad Pennington was a quarterback for the Jets, right? Mm -hmm. he, had, he tore his rotator cuff. He had it repaired twice. He never really returned to play. Uh, we're getting better and better at the repairs and at the rehab and the biology of all this. So the success rate of shoulder instability and rotator cuff repair in, in athletes, we quote, is about 80 to 85 percent of athletes are going to return to the, the same pre-injury level of function mm -hmm. or higher. There's 15% of people who won't. But so I that's think a that's, pretty high number. But it, it's, it's so interesting. It's if you think same about the process, complexity. But I should say different process, but same, same kind of injury. Young athlete, it's a quick tear. It's a quick, literally a, an acute, yeah. traumatic jo a jolt. And the older person like me, it's just simply wear and tear after years and years. Yeah, yeah. the only caveat I would say to that is a slip and fall in the older age group is very oftentimes going to pull your entire rotator cuff off. Yeah. So okay. ice is dangerous, right? Yeah. So people slip and fall on the ice and they'll come in and they, they can't lift their arm mm -hmm. all of a sudden. You know, those are surgical indications. Right. Those people get an operation right away. So, um, we're, so we're going to talk more about surgical approaches and particularly to the arthritis of the shoulder and some of the newer things, which are really quite exciting when we come back after this short break. Hi, Vicki and I are back with Dr. Paul Protomastro, expert in all things shoulder and, and <laughs> orthopedic surgeon. We're complaining about our own shoulder injuries while That's right. <laughs> during the break. <laughs> and the rotator cuff is so important. We talked about that a lot, but let's talk about the rest of the shoulder. So the shoulder joint itself can undergo degenerative change over yeah, time. Yeah, they're all sort of linked together. You have an unhealthy rotator cuff, your shoulder gradually begins to deteriorate. Um, there's two different concepts. So if your rotator cuff is chronically torn, I mean, you don't have it repaired or the repairs don't work or you re-tear it, the, the shoulder will become unbalanced. The ball will start to migrate up and forward and backwards and not stay centered in the socket. And that will start to d damage the surface. Um, we have a pictorial, that, uh, pictorial here which will show us the anatomy of the ball up, and yeah. socket joint. Okay, here we are. Um, so the bones of the shoulder are essentially the humerus bone, which is your arm bone, which has the ball on the top. Mm -hmm. which moves within a socket in your shoulder blade or your scapula bone. Now an analogy that's helpful is a golf ball 
and a golf tee, okay? So the humerus is the golf ball and the tee is the shoulder blade. Now just like a golf ball, the, the head of the humerus is coated in a slippery white frictionless surface known as articular cartilage. The socket's covered with it as well. This surface is critical for our joints to move freely and not have pain, okay? Um, if we could move to the next picture. Sometimes genetically, sometimes as a, uh, as a result of trauma, sometimes as a result of chronic instability, that cartilage can wear out and the bones start to rub on each other. And that hurts. And that grinds mm -hmm. and it hurts and it gets swollen and it becomes a source of misery. You lose shoulder motion, you lose shoulder function, and you lose your quality of life because you can't get your arm where it needs to go and you're in pain. Right. So this is a, a picture of a shoulder replacement. When the ball and socket loses its cartilage and people are in pain all the time and conservative treatments don't work, we can take the shoulder pain away and restore the shoulder mobility and function. The way we do this is we open the shoulder joint through an operation and we remove the ball, the, the bony ball, and then we replace it with a metal ball. That metal is highly polished and that metal ball will then articulate or move against a plastic socket that we put over the golf tee. So we put a new plastic socket and a new metal ball. That will take away the grinding. It takes away the bone pain. It can restore a painless shoulder. It is a big operation, which has risks, but it is very reliable at decreasing pain and restoring and function. Do you, we can see in there because the whole rotator cuff has been removed. Do you need an intact rotator cuff for this operation to work? Yes, you do. So for osteoarthritis, that in order to do a, a shoulder replacement, a primary shoulder replacement, you must have an intact or a repairable rotator cuff. So as we talked about, that soft tissue envelope, that cuff keeps the ball and socket right. balanced. If there's no rotator cuff, this ball and socket will not function right. properly. So the bottom line is you always need an intact rotator cuff. That's the ideal state. Well, when I first came out of training 10 years ago, that was the, the case. If you mm -hmm. didn't have an intact rotator cuff and you had arthritis, there was very little that we could do. Mm -hmm. There's a new technology that's evolved that we'll talk about in a minute called a reverse total mm -hmm. shoulder replacement, which is designed for people who do not have a repairable rotator cuff. So this, cuff. Paul, is mainly for people with arthritis of the shoulder joint and, and pain from that, that rubbing of the two bones. Correct. Which, as you, say, as you said, you can eliminate and give yeah. back uh, comfortable shoulder mobility. That's right. We have right. another picture coming up um, that shows that uh, on an x-ray. Right. So this is an x-ray picture of a patient of mine who failed conservative treatment. So we've tried cortisone injections. We have injections of joint lubricant mm -hmm. called hyaluronic acid. Uh, we do extensive physical therapy to try to restore motion and, and, de and in increase function. Uh, and medications can help. When those fail, an operation like this will be a definitive solution for the pain. And that thing that looks like a mushroom, that big white mushroom, just to point out the head is that polished shoulder joint. That's the, mm -hmm. the ball. metal ball replacing your bony right. ball that sits on a metal stem that goes, goes down the center right. of the humerus bone. So you can actually right. see that in the picture where the stem is fitting right. into the rest of the human. And that's the, quite stable. On the right side, you see a small uh, white um, metallic stem that's yeah, actually sitting that? in the shoulder blade. That's the stem that supports the plastic socket. Right, that's a screw, right? That's it's a screw that supports okay. the plastic socket. You can't see the plastic socket on an x-ray, mm -hmm. but it's there as the new interface between the humerus and the shoulder blade bone. So go on to the next slide. So this is an image of a different technology, a newer technology called a reverse total shoulder. It's called reverse because the, we put the ball where the socket was, and we put the socket where the ball was. And I think people can see that here. The humerus, again, is that thing going up and down on the left, and on the top of that is a concave socket. Whereas yes. before we had a ball Whereas there. Whereas that was right. originally the ball, and right. you can see the ball coming off the scapula. Come mm -hmm. up. So this is a mechanical solution to a biologic problem of a rotator cuff that's deficient or cannot be replaced. Mm. So this is a, what we call a semi-constrained device where the ball and socket are relatively stable, okay, and, and, the, and the socket will rotate around the ball, 
but this lowers the axis of rotation of the joint to a, and allow the larger muscles, the pectoralis and the deltoid muscle, to now raise mm -hmm. your arm because you've created a fulcrum or an axis of rotation. Does that arm hang a little bit lower than after this it surgery? It actually does. So the distance between the humerus bone and the shoulder blade bone above increases. That's yeah. actually what you're trying yeah. to do. And the increase is about three centimeters. Oh, so that's so you could, an inch, an inch and a half. A so it's a trade-off. This is, this is a salvage op surgery for people who are miserable and totally dysfunctional because they've had a rotator cuff tear for a decade or two. Mm. And all those things projecting out from the ball into the, those are screws? Those are screws, those are screws that it. bolt the yeah. ball into yeah. the socket. Yeah. And, in the, and as we said, in this operation, there is no rotator cuff anymore. Right. Okay, so and you have one more slide after yeah, this, yeah. Paul, I think. Here so we go. So this is now an x-ray X -ray. of a patient of mine that's undergone a reverse total mm -hmm. shoulder replacement. And again, you see the ball is bolted into the shoulder blade, and the stem now has a socket on it to allow a rotation around that ball where that doesn't hurt. So people always ask me, I'll ask you, do these things set off the alarms and... Uh, in uh, airports? <laughs> um, the answer is yes. This is a lot of metal. This is the, this is the largest shoulder procedure we do. Um, it has risks, um, but quite frankly, it is, it's, it's a solution to an unsolved problem. Uh, up until 2000, meaning in the history of man, rotator cuff arthropathy was not really a treatable problem uh, other than fusing your shoulder where you make your arm bone grow to your shoulder blade bone, which is mm. a disabling, miserable surgery. So this or you was just mostly to managed it. with pain control and cortisone shots. Pain control, shots cortisone and shots, and you don't use your arm anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here we are in 2016. We have a new technology that is a solution for people who are otherwise um, disabled by a chronic rotator cuff deficiency. The surgery itself, this is a same day surgery, patients go home the same day, but then they have an extensive recovery or do they usually spend some time that's, in the hospital? That's true of rotator cuff repairs. Mm. So when we're repairing the tendons through the arthroscope, everyone's going to come in and out and go home the same day. Right. These shoulder replacements are bigger operations. They have more pain associated with them, so uh, you'll need some pain medicine for the first 24 hours. And we also have to give people antibiotics longer. Okay. So on average, most patients who are going to get a shoulder replacement will stay in the hospital one night, sometimes two nights. Um, historically, people would go to rehab, you know, inpatient rehab for mm -hmm. a week or two. Haven't done that in five years. Um, these surgeries are so solid. Uh, I get people out of a sling in a, in a week to 10 days. You can start moving your elbow, wrist, and hand right away. It's a difficult, prolonged recovery, but you're not disabled by the surgery. And um, I tell most people who undergo a shoulder replacement, it's a two to three month recovery until you're independent, you're out of pain, and you're feeling the benefits of the procedure. But this is a recovery which is more of an active recovery as opposed to the rotator cuff recovery which we talked about total rest. For a shoulder replacement, you're actually, the, participating in some sort of active physical therapy. Absolutely correct. Okay. So, um, you know, shoulder replacement rehab is, is more progressive because we don't have really have to wait for those degenerative right. tendons to heal. You've already replaced the joint. It's right. Business well, I as think usual that's all this great news is how much can be done today for chronic Absolutely. shoulder pain. Right. You know, all the way from repairs of the rotator cuff all the way up to replacement of the shoulder, which That's is correct. A pretty remarkable Absolutely. to see where we're going. Yeah. And Paul, thank you very much. I thank really you appreciate you coming the on the show. When we come back, we'll have today's health question. But right now, let's take a look at some of our future events. Here is this week's viewer question. Hi, my name's Kendra, and I was wondering, how do you repair a dislocated shoulder? Kendra, we're lucky we have an expert here who does that all the time. How do you repair a dislocated shoulder? And say a little bit more about what are the repercussions of having a dislocated shoulder? Well, a dislocation is where the humerus bone jumps out of the socket. Okay. Here, yes. Right. The most common mechanism or injury pattern is a fall on an outstretched arm where your arm gets pushed up and behind yourself and the ball dislocates out the front. 
If you ever dislocate your shoulder, you'll know it. it it's very painful. painful. Yeah. People with a dislocated shoulder need to either go to an urgent care facility, an orthopedic urgent care facility, or an emergency room, and have that joint put back into place. Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. You have to, we manipulate it, and if that doesn't work, we put you under anesthesia. Uh, then a period of in a sling and a period of rehab to strengthen the muscles. The problem is, to dislocate your shoulder, you're going to tear ligaments and cartilage in the shoulder. If your shoulder continues to dislocate, we have to do surgery to repair the cartilage and the ligaments to keep the ball and socket from dislocating. That operation, it takes about five to six months to recover, but it has a 90 to 95% chance of your shoulder never dislocating again. How common is it to have this happen? I mean, this happens. Uh, shoulder dislocations are very common in the young athletic population. So we see them in teenagers and 20s. And this is exactly what my yeah. son had right. and Paul took care of him. The more yeah. violent and the more velocity your activities are, the higher the likelihood yeah. that your shoulder comes out. Okay, and that's a great informational message to get out to our yeah. viewers. And so you should have you. an x-ray if it's... If you it should is. definitely have an x-ray after you dislocate your shoulder because you, if you have a fracture associated, meaning you've broken the bone as part of the dislocation, it's those oftentimes manage. require more urgent surgical intervention than if it's just a soft tissue injury. It's All right. Great. Well, that there is we great it. information. Uh, so you young athletes at home, be careful. Don't fall like this. <laughs> and <laughs> if take you care have, of yourself. If you have a question you would like to ask us on Health Talk, please contact us at healthtalk at norwalkhealth.org. Vicki and I want to thank our guest today, Dr. Paul Protomastro, for coming on Health Talk. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. And we will see you next week on Health Talk. Stay bye well. Bye-bye.